Now, what is up, theology nerds? This is Trip, and you're listening to Homebrewed Christianity, where since the year of 2008, over 1,300 episodes of scholars across the disciplines, theologians, philosophers, scientists, historians, biblical scholars, all bringing the wisdom from the ivory tower and dropping it right into your earpiece. Why? Ah, because humans have been tasked with some big old questions. We've been wrestling with them for millennia. And today, we need the resources of the guild, the professionals, but also the experience of each of us to think through our faith. And that's what we do. That's what we do. We don't want to think for you. We want to think with you. And today on the podcast is my friend, Andrew Schwartz. He is the executive director of the Center for Process Studies. We did our PhDs at the same time, and you will discover in this conversation that we're friends. That's right. We're friends. There's a certain flavor, people say, to homebrewed episodes when Tripp's talking to his friend. Some of you love them. Some of you are like, I know, it means they're long and uh, you talk almost as much as the guest. And that's true. It's an affirmation. When I talk more, it's because I'm into it and I'm excited. So look, look, this is one of those episodes. And in it, uh, Andrew, as the executive director for the Center for Process Studies, comes on and answers a bunch of questions about process thought from you homebrewed Christianity listeners. Oh, yeah, he first talk, talks about, like, what are his favorite books to use when teaching process? Then uh, we discuss how Whitehead came to believe in God again, why process panentheism is superior to other panentheisms. Um, we talk about the relationship of process panentheism, panpsychism, an article he and Tom Ord wrote, why process theology or process thought is reaching more people now uh, than ever, and, um, you know, who you would want to invite for a dinner party with Whitehead. So, I mean, that, those are the questions uh, people sent in. Uh, well, they sent more. But those are the ones we got to because sometimes a question requires a long response. And if it doesn't require it, sometimes it gets it. When friends are nerding out with their geek out, oh, yeah, this is fun. Now, uh, I want to give a shout out to the Center for Process Studies. If you are interested uh, in connecting with them, there'll be a link on the website. Uh, they also have tons of resources. So whatever discipline you're in, there's probably a group of process scholars uh, working on it, and you can connect with them. Uh, they have tons of old archives and stuff. If, you, if you're if you one of the people that listen to this podcast while you're, say, in seminary or graduate school, and you decide to write a paper on something, and you're like, Trip, on Twitter DM, Trip, I'm looking for, insert question about your research topic and process, Andrew is a guy I message, and then he tells me all sorts of stuff, and then I message you back, and you're like, oh, my goodness, Trip, How did you know these? How did you have access to all this? Oh, wow, wow, wow. What I did is I'm friends with Andrew Schwartz. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he is a process bibliography. And, uh, yeah, so anyway, you should definitely check uh, out Andrew, his work, and such at the Center for Process Studies. Before we jump in to this episode, I want to remind you all, uh huh. That coming up this Lent is Jesus deconstructed. There's a slash between the D and the constructed because that makes it cool. Learn that in graduate school. Anyway, my friend Diana Butler Bass is joining me over Lent to wrestle with Jesus, all the different Jesuses we've met, all the baggage that Jesus and his fan club bring, and then what do you do with Jesus? Lent, that season where we think about the way of Jesus as we journey to the cross and resurrection. Well, Jesus is a complicated subject, and we're going to do it all together. Go to JesusDeconstructed.com. You can join. It's free. You can just donate zero or a million dollars or anything in between. But we would really love any of you that are asking questions, wrestling with Jesus, to join up. Um, Diana and I totally excited to do this. She's an American uh, historian of religion um, and, and just wrote a book called Freeing Jesus. That's pretty amazing. And um, as you may or may not know, I've written two books on Jesus. <laughs> and so we will be using uh, our um, our re writings on Jesus, but also the questions and such. And I've already gotten in over 100 responses when I posted online about people's biggest struggle uh, with Jesus and uh, the, the biggest uh, ideas or things they struggle with thinking about Jesus, already over 100 responses, and we're using those to shape the class, all right? So if you joined up at JesusDeconstructed.com, make sure you respond to the question thing because, uh, yeah, we're going to shape it around the actual questions and struggles people are having. JesusDeconstructed.com. All right, now it is time to get pumped 
with my fellow member of the John Cobb Fan Club, Executive Director of the Center for Process Studies, and my friend, William Andrew Schwartz. Buckle your theological safety belt. It's about to get metaphysical. Excellent. Hello, everyone. This is Trip. And on the podcast is a friend of mine, Andrew Schwartz. What's Hello. up? What's up, Trip? Now, um, you you are a part of the Center for Process Studies. Uh, you didn't just do your PhD and, and when I was, so we got to hang out and be friends. Now you're just like uh, you're you're a big wig, right? Like um, you are, you're like an actual entity of. Uh, <laughs> Of process. Well, why don't you why don't you share everyone a bit about what you're doing and uh, your your new move up to uh, <laughs> up to Oregon? Definitely, yeah. So I'm I'm standing on the shoulders of giants, uh, John Cobb and, and David Ray Griffin. I serve as executive director of the Center for Process Studies, which is a faculty center established by Griffin and Cobb in uh, the 70s, 1973, um, at Claremont School of Theology, and Claremont School of Theology uh, has been in this process of transitioning, um, affiliating with Willamette University in Salem, Oregon. So I made the move. The center made the move with me. And um, I'm serving as assistant professor of process studies and comparative theology uh, at CST at Willamette, uh, enjoying life in the Pacific Northwest. Oh, yeah. And if if you're listening to this, you have been process curious or thinking about... um, you, you know, uh, doing some further graduate work in process thought, you definitely want to holler at the Center for Process Studies. Not only can I tell you about some of the cool programs that, that are, you know, being reshaped as I joined Willamette University, right, like getting together with faculty across that uh, research university, but also um, Andrew's like the most connected process person on the planet. Like he's got friends in Europe, got friends in China and everywhere in between. Um, like it, he, he, uh, he, he gets around <laughs> I mean, intellectually, intellectually, yeah. he's, he's very, he's a, he's a nexus on, Zoom. Yeah. on he's a ne- yes, on Zoom. <laughs> so, um, maybe the, the first place to start is for you to say exactly like, where did you come from and how did process get on your radar? Because, um, I, I don't think if you were talking to, you know, like 16 year old, little Schwartz, he's just sitting there in, in his uh, Bible study or Sunday school or whatever. He wasn't thinking, you know what I'm going to do one day? I'm going to be the executive director for the Center for Process Studies. No, no, he was not. Where did I come from? Well, um, my mother and my father um, fell in love. And, um, you know, anyways, we don't have to go into that detail, I guess. Uh, so, Really? But I was thinking you might want to. Like, November 17, 1984. I was born. Um, so actually, I grew up in a multi-religious household. Uh, dad's Jewish, mom's Christian. Um, so that was always kind of interesting. But I was raised Christian, went to um, Northwest Nazarene University, part of this Wesleyan holiness movement, in order to study pastoral ministry. Why, I ask you? Oh, yeah. Thanks for asking, Trip. Uh, so that's because I wanted to devote my life to the things that mattered most. And at the time I was like, well, nothing matters more than God and salvation, eternal life. Are you kidding me? Like if I'm going to devote myself to God, might as well be my whole self. And that includes my job. So I'm going to go and study pastoral ministry with the Nazarenes uh, in Idaho. Well, one of those Nazarenes uh, was Thomas J. Ord. Uh, who is uh, an, an amazing guy and theologian who's doing open relational theology, um, a closet process theologian. Let's just say it and say what it is, right? Uh, I, I mean, you said it. Um, <laughs> yeah. he, he, he is inspired by uh, thinkers like Whitehead, Hart Sorn, Daniel Day Williams, uh, John Cobb, uh, David Ray Griffin. But he's been able to... Um, carry on his own thought and articulate the sort of core values of that process relational perspective um, to an evangelical audience um, that has a a different frame and set of commitments that aren't just sort of metaphysical, but also biblical. So I think he's he's doing a great job sort of bridging that gap. But anyways, when I 
when I started studying theology um, under, under Ord, um, I quickly became uh, interested in this sort of process perspective, right? The, no, the idea of a relational God. It just made a lot of sense to me. Um, so I went on to, to seminary with the Nazarenes, started doing uh, religious pluralism, got graded down on some papers because I, quote unquote, sounded too much like John Hick and process thought. Um, not and enough like, like John Wesley different. in the Bible. <laughs> you're like, look, there's a distinction between John Hick and John Cobb. That's, That's the wrong John. John Cobb's the process guy, not John Hick. Yeah. yeah. John Hick's that neo-Kantian pluralist. Like he's not... Yeah. Anyways. So, but then it's like, oh, wow. I, I don't know what, I think the first time I met John Cobb, uh, I went to the, uh, to Azusa Pacific for the Wesleyan Theological Society uh, meeting. And like, I was like a grad student uh, at uh, the Nazarene seminary. And I was like, huh. I think I ended up driving Cobb because he was going to be a, a keynote speaker for us. And somebody had to pick him up from Claremont and take him over to Pasadena. And I was like, I'll do that. So I'm like sitting in the car with Cobb, for, not from California, by the way. Right. So like I was like from like Washington state and then like lived in Idaho and now Kansas city. So like California freeway driving, if you're not familiar with it, it's is, its own thing. It's its own. It's intense. Um, yeah. And it's got its own set of rules too, right? Like you don't really, it's like you put on your blinker and people start speeding up and you're just like, why aren't you letting me yeah, over? You only turn it on when you're halfway <laughs> right, in the lane. Right. It, it was just to let you know, I did intend to do that. I'm not swerving your So I'm pretty sure that was, Cobb was mostly just concerned for his life and his well being <laughs> at the time. He was like, just get me there, right? Uh, stop talking and asking me questions. Of course, I'm asking him all sorts of questions. Oh, yeah. Do you? Tell me about process theology. Oh, do you know John Hick? Because I was doing my thesis on Hick. And like, I only later found out like, yeah, they were colleagues, but like they had very different perspectives and approaches to things. Uh, and Cobb was not really interested in talking about Hick. Um, you know, so anyways, it was fun. But uh, a couple years later decided I'm going to continue to follow in Tom Ward's footsteps, uh, who also went to Northwest Nazarene for his undergrad, the Nazarene Seminary for his uh, master's, and then Claremont Graduate University for the PhD. I, I did the same, not because I was an Ord copier, but um, just worked out that way, I guess, and uh, looked for a job while I was a student. And I applied for the library at the Claremont Colleges to uh, work in the archives there because I had just come from two years of archive experience with the Nazarene headquarters. And I didn't get the job. Uh, not qualified enough for the, the Claremont Colleges library position. So I said, oh, well, what else is there? And there was an opening at the Center for Process Studies for a communications director. And I said, bingo, perfect. You like communicating. What better way to develop my professional network then sending out emails and corresponding with all these brilliant scholars that are part of this process community. Yeah. It worked. And um, things happened. People retired. Opportunities emerged. I just kept saying yes at the right time, got lucky. And before you know it, bingo, bango, bongo. I'm executive bingo, director. Bango, bongo. And you moved yeah. to Washington. And moved back, yeah, moved back to the Northwest to close to family. So Yeah, that's awesome. It's so, kind of surreal, to be honest. Well, uh, I would qual. I think it qualifies as a Yahtzee and the uh, job market for Kismet. Know, PhDs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> the, you're, you're like, um, it, and you didn't adjunct for seven years at nine schools, which is always impressive. Yeah. Nope. I, I, it was. Uh, uh, really just a, a series of fortunate circumstances, being in the right place at the right time, saying yes, and yeah. So, um, all right. So I've been collecting questions people sent in about process thought. And since you're it. the executive director, I I know that you have every answer to every question anyone would ever ask about process thought. So the beauty of the, my position, I think, is that if, if I say this is what process people believe, no. uh, then it's like, oh, now it's gospel, right? It's fact. Um, oh, well, in that case. Yeah. Like, so I just, what, I will make things up is what I'm okay. telling you. Well, what's the most process Beatles album? <sighs> oh, no, it's uh, a... <laughs> 
It's a great question. I, I'm just saying, you get, now you can just pick your favorite and it's official. You know? Is that on the list? No, no, it's not. I just thought like if you're if you're if you're going to whichever one has all you need is love on it, right? Like getting that. Um, that seems very processed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I do know um, Janine, who used to be a part of the uh, the Process Center and runs the Process Century Press. Like mm-hmm. her church put together a whole liturgy that uses all Beatles songs, and it's a Process liturgy. So it has I to be possible. That. That's yeah. great. Yeah. So it has to be possible. But um. It, it, it was like before there was a Eutucharist. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. So uh, uh, first question is um, w- when you, when you get to teach process thought, what are, is your favorite book to teach and why? Mm. It's a great question. I actually like, I'm going to cheat and I'm going to say, I'm going to give two books okay. that I like. So I really enjoy using uh, Bob Mesley's, actually I'll say three. So Bob Mesley's text, uh, Process Relational Philosophy. Mm-hmm. Um, he's got the the orange theology one too. But I really like the philosophy one um, and the emphasis that he has on um, sort of building up uh, process worldview from the perspective of uh, observing your own experience, right? What is it like to be you? What is it like to be an experiencing person in this world? And then extending that, um, you know, sort of the, what are the conditions for experiencing sort of change and, you know, the, the experience flow, experience relationality in connection, experience value, Right, and then you extend those to sort of uh, the rest of the cosmos, to God, to the world, and you realize, oh, these are actually features of reality, um, not just features of my own personal experience, but sort of the underlying framework for all experience. So I love it, um, and he says a lot of great things about power in that book. It's very accessible and it's nice and short um, by Templeton Press, I think. Um, so that's a good book. I also like another really short one. Maybe I just like short books. Um, is Philip Rose has a book uh, on Whitehead. And what I like about that book is that it talks about uh, Whitehead's view uh, as an aesthetic philosophy. So there's really this orientation about beauty and value um, in that using that lens to understand Whitehead's metaphysic, which I think sometimes we can get bogged down in the philosophy of it and be like, oh, just about this cosmology, metaphysic, big, you know, difficult stuff to understand. But um, if you prioritize value as sort of the the nature of reality as understanding and experiencing value relations, it's like all of a sudden now, right? Like it's it's more it's more accessible, I think. Um, so he talks about, for example, the idea that um, to be to exist, uh, right, is to be the center of values felt and the source of values given. Um, so when you're the center of a value felt, uh, you're the center of an, an experience, you're an experiencing subject. And what do you experience? You feel. And what do you feel? You feel values. So it's like that's sort of the whole process perspective, the whole process worldview is designed around um, the center of subjectivity and, and experiencing subjects. Um, but we're also objects in the sense that we're sources for other people's value or for the next moment of, of experience's value. Um so I don't know. He's got great stuff. But the third one I like is uh, Brad Artson's, uh, Rabbi Artson's text. Um, is it God of Relationship? I think is what it's called. Uh, it's another shorter, uh, accessible book. Um, is it like really, Relationship and Becoming or something like yeah, that? Yeah, God of Relationship and Becoming. That's exactly right. Um, it's a great text. And he's got some um, some great analogies that... Um, peel apart the the sort of Greek lenses of our philosophical and theological assumptions and, um, and says, yeah, well, when you, you strip back that paint and you, you pull off the, um, uh, you know, the, the wood panels, you realize underneath all of that is actually a very rich uh, process kind of perspective. Um, And we just need to recover what was already there as opposed to saying, the process Whiteheadian worldview is somehow foreign to um, a, a Judeo-Christian Western perspective. He's like, no, 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 no. 
all that platonic stuff, you know, all that Greek stuff, like that was actually imposed on onto our philosophical and religious perspective. And we just need to strip that away. So I don't know. It's good. Those are, those are three books I like. No, I, I, I think that's great. I haven't, and I haven't mentioned the Rose one or maybe I have, I don't know, but I love that you emphasized the, the role of aesthetics in it because I, I think it was in reading that book where, um, you know, the question of aesthetics and value and stuff, uh, uh, kind of made sense to me in a way that process thought I, if you're comparing an event that's value free, then you think like, like then you're imagining an event where physics only that, which is, can be contained in physics is called reality. And like the Mesley book that says, begin with your own experience, right? The, your first person experience of the world is one that is valuing the world as it comes to you and you're contributing through your own agency in whatever ways you're conscious and experiencing it to the world and the possibilities you're assessing and responding to. Like you don't know in your own experience what an event is apart from events evaluation. And, uh, and, and Rose kind of emphasized that. And I think that that contrast that um, have you given a complete account of something if you've only given an account uh, from a, uh, a quantitative way, right, that you get in physics, um, right? Like, and so Whitehead's not trying to uh, dismiss science. He's trying to actually build a, a, a philosophy out of contemporary science. But yeah. also, like, you can't throw away the fact that we're experiencing subjects. That's part of what has to be included in your explanation, and I find that, you know, that element in the Rose book uh, is really helpful um, and really a contact point, I think, for thinking of why it is Whitehead decided to start talking about God again, right? That's interesting. What, say more about that, why you think Whitehead brings in God. Well, just in the question of valuation, um, in one sense, in the history of, in Whitehead's own biography, um, God gets eliminated in a sense from his own quest because of the problem of evil, the death of his son in the world war. Right. Um, and it's not until in science in the modern world, early in his um, kind of turn towards kind of uh, asking the big metaphysical questions again in light of new science and such that um, he recognizes uh, that um, in a sense, and he said this in his lectures on philosophy of nature, that so often science bifurcates nature, and then there's like nature dead, and then there's nature alive that doesn't get talked about. Or like Deleuze talks about it as like science hard and science soft. Or there's this like two different modes of describing the universe, and because of the power of objective, uh, objectifying uh, epistemology of distance in science – it now has swallowed up the life on this other side. And, and he's wanting to, to reintroduce it because he also thinks that there, there, needs to, there needs to be an explanation for why it is uh, the spectrum of possibility tend towards greater uh, complexity, depth of subjectivity, these types of things that are necessary things to explain in a world if there isn't a God, right? Like um, you can, it shows up in different sciences in different places, but for him, he was like, no, no, no. The problem with most religious thinkers is they then look at things that need to get explained, go God, and then reinsert shit theology or let's just, or classical theism or whatever. And they're like, we got a God of the gaps. We, now we can insert our, our deal here. And he didn't want to go there. He just wants to go, why is it that the, that, the possibilities of a moment are demonstrably valued towards uh, generative existence. Like, why is it complexity grows in ways that from, if we're using our dominant picture of the cosmos now, quantum fluctuations in a vacuum create states of constancy that allowed what we call solid state physics to emerge and then multiple dead stars and gravity and such till that we have a periodic tape like this whole thing is built that probability is valuated 
towards, right, the creative advance of a network of organisms in existence, right, like existing. And so then he goes like, well, something has to explain that. And so the primordial nature of God, right, that the possibilities in any moment that the entity, they're valuated towards this deep reservoir of cosmic value that you see in, you know, the, the growth of complexity in the cosmic story that you see in the call of the other and in, in an ethical situation, the eyes of the other kind of make a demand of you. That's another place. Or uh, aesthetics and beauty. Like when you're seized by something, not because it's an it's a equation that demands assent, but because it's it gives you yourself or the world back in a new way. And it's beautiful. Anyway, that I feel like I, I it was almost a process sermon, Andrew. That was, that was a little process sermon. I loved it. Well, <laughs> you know, something that you said, I think, uh, is really helpful. And that's remembering for Whitehead. So, so it's a lot of times, right? The notion of God is treated, uh, used as a way to sort of uh, fill the gaps, to make sense of those things that we don't quite understand. So Whitehead says it's, that God is not to be treated as an exception to all metaphysical principles to save their collapse, because that's often what happens, right? Is that our metaphysics doesn't uh, quite explain everything. So we're going to come up with this idea of a supernatural entity that can uh, explain away the things that don't, aren't quite captured in our metaphysical system. And, and Whitehead's like, no, 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 no. That, that's not the way things are. In fact, it's just the opposite. God is the chief exemplification of these principles, not an exception to them. And I think it's bringing God into nature, right? It's this uh, naturalizing God as opposed to emphasizing a sort of a supernatural um, out there other than set of principles and ideas. Um, it's incorporating God into the natural order of things um, is a huge step in Whitehead that I also think a lot is, is motivated by and allows for process theology to be so compatible with science, um, to be compatible with um, an environmental worldview, uh, and to to make sense, right? There's, it's it's when Whitehead tries starts off in his speculative metaphysics, right, which is you know can sound intimidating. Um, he's really asking this question: Okay, what sort of things are there, and how are those things related? And I think when you talk about God as part of those things that are and those things that are related, as opposed to outside of, um, it shifts everything, right? Um, so process panentheism ends up becoming an important perspective and all of that. Oh, yeah. Okay, so, well, maybe we'll skip a question because there was a panentheism one. Um, what was the panentheism question? Well, no, I'm skipping to the panentheism <laughs> question. Oh, oh, got it, got it. All right. Um, uh, now, you don't have to. You don't have to respond to their questioning and my sweeping dismissal of other people, Andrew. You're too nice to do this. But uh, uh, question next time you talk process trip, you made a giggly sweeping dismissal towards a whole host of other forms of panentheism, and are like, yeah, I remember my baby steps to process. Can you describe exactly how a process panentheism? It's different than, say, like Moltmann or one of the others, and um, try not to giggle at them. I, I mean, it's kind of a snarky question. Well, but, yeah, but there deserves a snarky answer, right? So I think uh, the yeah, difference so, between process panentheism and other forms is that process panentheism makes sense. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it actually works. Um you know, to say that God is 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 somehow in the world, yet also supernatural and, you know, outside of the world and in the world, we don't know how it really works. So there's sort of, I think, process, uh, or, sorry, a, a pantheistic perspective um, for, for like a classical theologian is going to be more compelling than a panentheist perspective, because there's no way of incorporating how God and the world actually interact. Um, and process, process does offer a way forward, I think. So it's, you know, actually, um, 
Roland Faber talk, talks about it in terms of uh, a trans pantheism as opposed to a, a process panentheism. And I think the reason for that is that God and the world are both mutually imminent and mutually transcendent. Um, so it ends up being the sort of both and perspective. Now, how exactly does that work? Well, that's when you get into the primordial nature, the consequent nature of God, um, the sort of notion of um, God in each moment taking in the world, right? All of the experiences that are happening, every actual occasion becomes part of the life of God. Um, God is ever expanding, right? So um, you get this notion of the size of God ever increasing, not because God now um, grows and changes and attains something that God previously lacked, but because as the world grows, um, God's uh, uh, what God is able to encounter and experience um, also expands and grows. Um, so, you know, they grow together, right? Um, yeah. Every new moment of reality is a new moment for God. Um, anyways, I don't, I don't know if that, I think I was getting off track about the uh, panentheism piece, but. Well, no, here's, here's what popped in my head while you were saying that. Um, and I don't know, I just wrote this on a post-it, so we'll decide if it's good or not. But if you're contrasting process panentheisms and others uh i came up with five places the contrast shows up i'll name them then you i'll before i won't name the second one then you can tell me what you think all right this uh, so like some panentheisms that aren't processed are uh they're they're still involve a type of supernatural theism um that either shows up uh but primarily shows up because they preserve a type of creation out of nothing where panentheism is only descriptive of God's history with the world, but not God's genuine identity, right? So the theism, uh, God was God all alone, then creates a world, does God's thing. And probably if it doesn't work out how God wants, just intervenes and fixes it. And then it goes back to how God wants and so the panentheism is more of a part of the, if you're using theological, Christian theology, like it's like an economic trinity thing. It's not really about how God is. Yeah. No, I think that's that's not a bad sticky note point. Um, it's interesting when we talk about panentheism, right? So what exactly is the N in panentheism? See, when you um, say that, I have flashbacks to Dr. Min. Yeah, that's funny. I was thinking of uh, Dr. Clayton, but um, <laughs> well, I was, it, uh, our our uh, Thomas professor Ansel Min. Uh, I, well, I don't think you were in this class, but R. one R. time he asked me what the N in entheism was like five times in a row, and I gave like I thought rather clear answers, and he he had he had none of it, like. And then he told me after class he felt bad for being aggressive, and I did better <laughs> than those people across the street. And I was like, "Oh, oh. I was those like, people, right. PST people, yeah, yeah, process people." <laughs> yeah, um, you know, it's funny though. So I think if uh, so, oftentimes a couple things. One is oftentimes uh, other forms of panentheism really only say that um, everything is in God. Um, so there's no sort of independent identity or transcendence in which the, the world is sort of apart from or beyond God. Um, everything is just in God. Um, sure, whatever, fine. Uh, except the problem is, is now we can't really explain how God and the world re relate, right? Mm -hmm. How, what does it mean for the world to be in God? Um, and I think you, you hit the nail on the head when you talk about this sort of deistic perspective, um, a supernatural God that never really intervenes in the world, um, set it in motion. I mean, it, it's, if you can't explain the God world relationship in a way that also uh, addresses the problem of evil, um, your panentheism is not going to work very well, I think. Yeah. Well, I mean, well, that's one, that's one of my later points. You see, so you're jumping ahead. You should have looked at my improvisational post-it note, Andrew. Uh, the second one is that panentheisms that aren't processed are spatial and not eventual. And so if your exactly. panentheism is spatial, then I'm, I'm look, I love Moltmann. So I'm only using him because I think everyone should read him. All right. But he uses like the Zen zoom story, right. For panentheism. So you got 
you got your your omni eternal deity just rocking out, probably enjoying thoughts, thinking about himself, because it's definitely him. If you have a anyway, and uh, and then God's like, I I have I create in loving freedom, so I'm gonna make a space in myself. I'm gonna evacuate, and then you get the, the zim zoom this space, and God creates, but that. God has to evacuate to actually have creation have genuine agency. So like once God creates, there's a kind of risk that goes there. But the entire time, because you're using the spatial metaphor, uh, it, there's always that potential, right, of uh, divine intervention. In it, um, the other, its integrity is actually possible because of the absence or the, the pulling back of God, the creating space within God. Um, and I'm, it's for free love, but I, it, it's like because it uses that spatial metaphor, it's just problematic. And then what is the eschaton? When that space has been redeemed, reconciled, maybe processed feminists would say conquered um, uh, and brought into the divine life because it's a spatial one. An eventual one, process style panentheism is going to do something, I think, rather important, that each event actually includes the non-competitive agency of God and God's in the creatures in whatever way they can respond. So there's a parallel between the physical and mental poles of God and the world. And so for the creature, they receive the past, right? And it determines what's possible. They receive the call, the lure, uh, the valuation of possibilities uh, from God, and they contribute their own agency, and it happens. And then that event of God and the world then is prehended or brought into the next moment. But in that picture, an eventual one, uh, God and the world are necessarily panentheistic because every moment's like a little kiss of God and the world with the creature. And each one gives itself to the other and cooperates in whatever ways or resists in other ways, but like the, no one's occupying the other one's space. And in fact, God's will is done not by God occupying us, but by us responding with our own agency to the call and lure of God. And so eventual process panentheism, significantly superior to spatial panentheism uh it's it, it just has the imagery is like so substance based it, it it creeps me out that's yeah. what do you think i th i think that's a, a a really good point and i actually think <laughs> this I, there's i have a few questions for our, our, our zim sum theorist right so god withdraws into god's self to create space for other than god so we, where does god go like we into God's self, okay, but, but but where, right? There's only God. Is there something else other than God for which God can vacate and create? I mean, how do you create the space uh, if you're all that there is? Uh, whatever, maybe we can answer that. But then it's like, well, what does it actually mean for God to be present in the world if God had to vacate in order to create the space for that world to exist? Um, how is God now actively imminent in a world that can only exist as a result of God evacuating. You know, so I think I think that's a, a huge problem with the spatial perspective of panentheism that, like you said, a, a temporal perspective that understands that um, each moment of becoming, right, each, each event, uh, every drop of experience that makes up reality is incorporated into the life of God um, sequentially, right? Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, okay, so you, you say that, that like... Uh... I don't want to derail my post-it note because it was high quality, 45 seconds of planning, Andrew. But um, no, I think the, like when you say temporal, I was saying eventual, but I like temporal makes more sense because then it doesn't get confused with uh, accounts of the event that are hermeneutical as opposed to ontological. Um, but, the, you know, there's one element about that that I find... I don't know. I don't know apart from it was trendy to stick it to Gnosticism, like why anyone reads the biblical text and says, we really need to preserve like Platonic 
perfection and deity because I mean, you've read Jeremiah, you've read Exodus. Like, like th- can you say something about that? Cause I know that you came from a Nazarene context, but did you have that same moment? Like when you realized the process style panentheism act, like when it thinks that the dynamism of God in the world, all the way to you as an individual person of faith to the cosmic story of evolution, all these things, it actually is imagining where in every moment there's a like a instantaneous entanglement that makes sense of, I don't know, why a covenant would be the main metaphor, right? What is a covenant? A covenant, I mean, it's kind of the framing device of the freaking Bible is God going, I'm going to be who I will be precisely because I'm the one that always shows up as your loving God, right? And then God's like, doesn't know how ridiculous we can be. Like the beauty of the story of Israel and the life of the church. Come on, we're depressing people to have picked as a as the body of Christ. But the beautiful part is that God's faith, ever faithful love, keeps showing up. Why do we not think that if you can actually cohere more deeply with the scientific picture of the world, that you wouldn't like go for it because it actually uh, is more biblical? That's I, I, is, I don't know if I just drink the John Cobb Kool-Aid so early in life that it just drives me nuts. This doesn't make sense. But like in your own story, the, was there like a moment where you realized, oh, junk? So you're saying that I could simultaneously be more biblical than the people that judge me and say stupid stuff to me on the Internet and like – engage in philosophical, scientific, and inter-religious conversations with gusto seeking justice and ecological civilization? Like, why wouldn't you do that? Yeah, I think that's a great question. You know, for me, uh, going back to Whitehead, right? Whitehead I appreciate doesn't... that you called it a question, Andrew. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is what happens when I talk to friends on the podcast. I'm like, well, I know I'm technically recording, but I have things I want to talk to you about. This is what I was thinking. (laughs) So Whitehead doesn't start with, here's what I think about God. Let me make sense of the world around that notion. It's quite the opposite. It's here's what uh, I, here's how I'm trying to make sense of, of the world as I'm experiencing the world. Right. So like using my faculties to try to make sense of what it's like to be and what that means for how things are, right? What, what sort of things are there and how are those things related? What are the sort of fundamental nature of reality and how is it constructed, right? And when you say that God is not an exception to those metaphysical principles, but the exemplification of them, well, what are those metaphysical principles? Well, everything's interrelated, right? Relationality is is not something that God chooses, but is part of the nature of God because God is, exemplifies relationality, right? So if you say, okay, the, the world is relational. Well, if God's the exemplification, that means God's the most relational. If you say that the world is in process and becoming, well, then God is the most in process, right? The most becoming. And I think this platonic notion of a, you know, if God's the exemplification of a uh, of, of platonic metaphysics. Well, now God is the, the least moved, the, uh, the most static, the most disconnected, uh, the most unchanging. Well, it's like, well, no wonder God is dead, right? Um, that's a God that can't do anything in the world and doesn't do anything. And if God could indeed do something because God is uh, all powerful, right? Well, now God's on the hook for all the horrible things that are happening because God could fix them and doesn't unilaterally, right? So I think, the, the, the problem of evil for me is a, one of the huge draws to process theology because it makes sense of a God that works uh, through relationship collaboratively with people persuasively rather than unilaterally. Um, so, you know, Hartshorn's um, omnipotence and other theological mistakes. Yeah. It's a book name. Yeah. It's a book name. It's a short book. It's dense and it's not particularly easy to read, but um it's a great title. Well, when I read it in undergrad, when a professor told me what I was, my complaints about Aquinas and philosophy of religion sounded processed and it's not compatible with Christianity. I just went to the library and was like, 
process philosophy. And then that was the shortest book. So I said, I'm reading that this weekend. And, uh, and, and when he says that omnipotence is a metaphysical compliment, God would like for you to take back. I just started laughing. And I, and the thing, the thing about that to me was the, the, I mean, I grew up Baptist. So, I mean, there are like seven years of my life. I read the entire Bible every year. There, it wasn't until I learned about classical theism in a church history class that I thought half the ideas most professional theologians think are obligatory were even on the menu. I'm like, well, you know, like there are just certain things that didn't make sense. Um, but here's, you already mentioned evil. So we got uh, supernatural. Uh, if you don't go process panentheism, you have the whole like, how did it get kicked off? Creation out of nothing, supernatural setup. When does it intervene? And then blah, blah, blah. You get the spatial version of panentheism is gross. Do we need um, to talk about creation out of nothing? Is that something that would, needs to be introduced here? Is that one of your sticky note points? Well, I, why don't you say something about that? I didn't. I didn't put it as its own, but it, it mentioned. So why is creation out of nothing? If I was going to make the most overrated doctrine in church history, right? So I used to say it was total depravity. But in the last three years, I've really come back around on how crappy human beings are for a lot of really obvious reasons. Um. And I feel like, like, I wouldn't like want to pitch it that way. But as Whitehead said, well, you know, the, the it's not it's not the creativity, or it's not the it, it's not the ugliness that needs to be explained. It's that something beautiful ever happens, right? Yeah. So, like, it, I regularly have found, and this is maybe going to Europe, where people think process people have libertine accounts of freedom. I'm like, no, no, like. The three powers at work in any moment. The past is the most powerful one. The power of the past. The power of the past is the most powerful. The creature has some agency, and God's like trying to like get us to suck a little bit less, but orchestrates the whole towards greater beauty, truth, goodness, adventure, and zest. Uh, but total depravity, you know, after being in lockdown for the last year, watching all this shit break down, I'm just like, I can I can work with that a little bit, <laughs> but creation I'm nothing. I think if I was creating power rankings of most overrated doctrines, I'm gonna go throw that up as number one. And uh, I'm gonna start with omnipotence as number one. Okay, but but what about what about Brother Tom Ward? I see. I said that we in our class recently. And if you heard him, he can massage omnipotence into, I don't even know what it is, but. Okay, that's fair. That's fair. We can keep the, the language of omnipotence if you want to say that God is all powerful and then completely redefine what you mean by power yeah. to be cooperative and persuasive rather than unilateral and coercive. Yeah. Sure, fine. Keep your language and confuse people uh, who are evangelical. You don't Think have to explain you, to me. I just <laughs> argued with Tom about this for two and a half yeah. months. You say like, one thing, you mean another. Yeah, yeah that's fine. That's okay. Tom is Tom's a theological uh, jujitsu jiu artist. <laughs> yes. I'm, okay, if you're listening to this, you should all message Tom. Tom's theological jujitsu. Andrew and I, not trying to jujitsu. God's not omnipotent. All right. It's just, it's just not, it would be offensive to God to say that. But creation, I'm nothing. <laughs> creation out of nothing so i i personally like seven minutes of me vamping before you talk about something well these so but it's related right so the oh, question yeah. of omnipotence and god's power and how god works in the world is also tied to how god creates right so there's a few things involved one is creator one of god's core attributes is it a necessary part of god's nature god is creator or was there a time when God was not creating or, you know, that God existed prior to having the status of creator, right? Um, so if, if you have a, a God creating out of nothing, well, how does, how does that come to be? Unilaterally. 
How else would it come to be? God has to bring the world into being unilaterally through coercive power. So the notion of, of omnipotence and God's coercive power is directly tied to the notion of uh, creation out of nothing. Um, process people want to say, well, wait a second. We actually think that creator, like love, like relational, is not some attribute of God that like God just decides one day, I'm going to put on my creator hat, but that God is the ever creator. God has always been in the process of creating because God has always been in relation to some creation. Now, how does this creation come to be? How did God come to be, right? You know, so maybe it's turtles all the way down. Maybe there's a little infinite regress there, but that's okay because God and the cosmos uh, can be ultimate, can be uh, sort of co-eternal, if you will. Um, so God is then, God needs some creation, some uh, other reality. Uh, we might even just call it the totality of finite things to relate might. to. Yeah, we might. might. I, I yeah. think it, the totality of finite things, that's interesting. That's um, catchy. But that it, that has to be there for God to work cooperatively to sort of call the world, to lure the world, to become what it is, right? So it's, it's I think there's, there's not universal agreement on how process people should view creation and origin stories. But the dominant sort of classic process perspective, I think, it's more of a creation out of chaos, right? It's God is organizing the chaos that is sort of, the, of, of previous worlds, of previous creations, right? Continually forming, reforming mm -hmm. uh, through this cooperative process uh, through the lure. So basically the way that God is uh, continuing to co-create the world with us today is the way that God has always been co-creating from always. Oh, I, I support this. So, uh, okay. I mean, I guess this is going to be on a podcast now, but here's something I'm working on, a way of pitching this. Uh, I don't know if it's high quality or material where I jujitsu something. This is mostly claiming something every Orthodox person thinks and then just Trojan horsing it. All right. So, you know, one of the things Cobb does with his Logos Christology and lots of process people do, and not just process people, a lot of open relational thinkers do. And, uh, theologians that engage in evolution and such. It's like the gospel of John gives us logos and the, the logos is made starts in Jesus, but the generative principle. I mean flesh. Yeah. Yeah. So, sorry. <laughs> well, I, I say Sarks because Sarks is not just a human, right? It's like, uh, you know, like stru structurally relational entity, right? An actual entity. If you, if you will, like, uh, anyway, um, uh, but the, uh, but that the Logos vision, um, if you connect it to what the, uh, um, Cappadocians and well, I guess it started with origin and such in the Trinitarian debates pick up from Athanasius is that like the sun is eternally generated. Right, so there was never a time you couldn't have the God the Father be eternal without a son. And this was, you know, for them setting up a logic where you have the Trinity forever, right? This is what they're going for. So they would say, that, well, the son's eternally generated because these heretics that act as if there was a time the son was not, the Arians, well, what's, what's their business? Well, they don't recognize that the eternal fathers eternally generating. And in Greek, it's a little more creepy on the sexual innuendo. Um, uh, uh, anyway, I'm not going to delineate that because I'm sure the editor would take it out, but uh, eternal generation of the sun. And I say to myself, well, John Cobb, blessed be his name, has recognized that, uh, the eternal Logos was e expressed, uh, especially for those of us that call Jesus the Christ, in a definitive and particular way that calls in a whole new structure of existence called the life of the church, participants of the kingdom of God, all that. Uh, but it, it also is revelatory of the principle of creative transformation in the entire uh, cosmic epoch that we're experiencing in our particular you know, event of space-time. 
Well, if you just recognize that the eternal generation of the Son is the eternal generation of the dance of God with the other in which God desires reciprocal faithful response, then you can have the eternal generation of the Logos, the wisdom Sophia of God, and not have to have creation out of nothing. What do you think? This is, I, I, this is my new propaganda piece I've been thinking about. So actually, you, you had me at Trojan horse theology, uh, process for evangelicals. I, I was kind of yeah. stuck on that. I was like, oh, yes, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> in the in the cover of the book looks like a a a, a ripped open like a, a condom wrapper is that the <laughs> no 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 yeah not that kind of uh, trojan it's um, like heresy control right yeah. like in, it's like <laughs> anyways so that's getting edited out the what i was uh thinking though is that <laughs> um it is interesting how there are these classic doctrines, uh, these biblical doctrines, as well as like, you know, things that have been part of um, quote unquote orthodox beliefs uh, throughout Christian history that make way more sense with a process lens than they do with a a Greek uh, platonic or Aristotelian lens. Like they just do. Um, Relationality is one of them. Uh, You know, creation is one of them. I mean, if you say, most evangelicals, most Christians want to say, of course, God is relational. And to be in relationship with God is a good thing. Well, what does it mean to be in relationship with a quote unquote loving God that can't feel anything and is not really part of the world and is always sort of separate from and, and never uh, moved by or, uh, or affected by the world? Like the doctrines of, of immutability and impassibility make no sense for the narrative of a relational loving God. No sense. Process says, We agree because God's not immutable and impassable. God is changing and deeply affected, right? Not the unmoved mover, but the most moved mover. Uh, You know, Clark Pinnock talks about that. Um, So I think, yeah, there's something to be said about saying, what is it that you already believe sort of intuitively? And here's how I'll help you make sense of that with process metaphysics. That's what you have with process theology. Yeah. Yeah. So I agree, but I don't know if you're really surprised. It's easy um, when you agree. Yeah. Yeah. I, I um, just wanted to endorse Andrew. Um, okay. So let, let's, we have an ever growing list of the preferential option for the process panentheism. We got, uh, you got to make sure you get rid of the supernatural option on divine agency. You got spatial panentheism overrated and uh, temporal panentheism superior you got problem of evil you don't even why do you want to why do you want to preserve the problem of evil when you don't have to right then you got creation out of nothing and eternal generation um that all right but i have two more two more you can tell me which one um, tell me which one's more intriguing. All right. So one is if you have panentheism, then you need a non-competitive type of divine action. And uh, it's really hard to get non-competitive divine action in a spatial vision of panentheism because it's always potentially supernatural, but a temporal one, non-competitive divine action recognizes that the interiority of the creature in each moment is the very place they interact with God, right? Like in a sense, God's call of, or of God's valuation of possibilities, right? So you have that, there's, we can explore that. Or um, non-process panentheism makes the problem of the one and the many even worse than it was with classical theists. The process panentheism makes the problem of the one and the many just a, like a wonderful opportunity to demonstrate the philosophical superiority of the process position. So, I mean, those are two, 
those are the other two reasons. And I wanted to ask some of the other questions. So you have to pick one you want to talk about and you can pick whichever one sounds more. So non-competitive divine action or the problem of the one and the many. I think both of those process panentheism uh, superior. Um, it, maybe, maybe we can answer those questions at the same time. Oh, oh maybe oh. it's through uh, the issue, the process perspective on the one and the many that explains uh, the non-competitive action, divine action. Right. Look at that. That's why you're executive director. Look at that. Just bringing it all together. Go ahead. Tell me about it. So I'm, I, you know, I think you think about um, what is, that's it. Right. What is, uh, so like, what is the, the sort of the, the thing that exists in the present moment? Right. Um, and it's this creative synthesis of what was the past, what could be, uh, so these possibilities, these eternal objects, these things that are being presented to us uh, through the lure of God. And then it's together synthesizing what was with what could be that creates what is in a present moment. Now that moment's fleeting. And once it's done, right, it becomes part of what was. Um, so it's this continual process of becoming uh, that just des describes what reality really is. Um, and in doing that, it makes sense on how God acts in relationship to what is and what was without uh, this sort of conflict, uh, right? Uh, so it's not um, one versus the many, it's the many become one and are increased by one. Um, and that is exactly how God works in the world is through the unity, the, unif uni the, the uniting the many into one in a present moment of concrescence um, which then become part of the many as the ocean, right? It's a, so I actually, I like to use the analogy, which I'm sure I stole from like, uh, I don't know, probably uh, Catherine Keller or somebody, the analogy of the ocean, right? So you think you got the ocean, you got the waves. Uh, each wave has a sort of moment in which it's sort of at its peak, right? Where the wave is truly a wave. Um, but that doesn't last very long. Uh, that wave crashes to the shore and the waters recede back into the ocean. Um, so where did that wave come from? It came from the past, all previous waves, uh, the, the body of the ocean. Um, once the wave sort of reaches its peak and crashes, where does it go? Back to the, the, the whole history of the world, right? The collection of previous waves. So I don't know. I think it's a great way of understanding reality in this sort of processual uh, perspective um, that unites God and the world through uh, this uh, creative integration of one and many. This is Marjorie Suhaki from her book, In God's Presence. God is like water flowing throughout the universe, like an ocean touching innumerable shores. The action of whose waves is sometimes like a chaotic clash of elements, whose terrible dynamism reshapes what is and brings new things to emergence. And the action of those waves is also gentle and quiet, nourishing all forms of existent life. The one form does not contradict the other, nor the varieties in between, for the nature of water is interaction with all elements in its path, taking the nature of each element into account in the resulting action. God is like water. Oh, yeah. That's what I'm talking about. I love Marjorie. I do, too. I do, too. I, but you got to admit though, like if you wrote that, you would take the rest of the day off. You would just say like, out, I'm out. You know, Doesn't that's like better. Don't, don't ruin it. You're like, God is like water. I said it twice. Cause I know what those three sentences in the middle sound like safe. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Maybe there's something to be said about, um, the contrast between uh, God is like a mountain and God is like water. Um, and classical theism is the sort of God is strong because God is unmoved and God is, you know, um, I don't know, inflexible or whatever. Uh, and then process God is more like water, adaptable, uh, flowing. Yeah. Those are fun analogies. It will in, and I remember misinterpretation of mountains, I think, but that's okay. Well, we don't need a Holy Tetons excursion, you know, that's high quality process jokes right there. The Holy Teton excursion. I'm, I, I, uh, in the creed class with Tom, um, 
I, I continuously use the phrase um, Abba of the Holy Tetons so much because, you know, like I believe in God almighty, uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, Father the Almighty, Tetons. yeah, Father Almighty. So I just kept saying Abba of the Holy Tetons, and I, it's just not quite catchy enough. But I really feel like it should make a T-shirt design, and I would I would wear it on a consistent basis. But we can love, build on this analogy, though. God is like water, but think about like what's the source of life, right? Um, water. What makes the Earth cooler than Mars? Water. Uh, what what do you make beer out of? Water. But See? well, Mars is technically cooler temperature wise. Ah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, but that not, does not have to do with water, but um, you know, yeah, relation to the sun. Yeah. But no, I love the 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 connection between it, it, you're able to put the non competitive divine action in connection to the many and the one. Um, all right. So, hold on, let me see. Okay, I'm gonna ask you three more questions, but these are not as extensive. All right. So recently you and Tom published something about panentheism and panpsychism. Uh, there are a number of panpsychist related questions, but that's because I'm working on it a lot. So then I mention stuff and act like everyone else is also currently doing a postdoc about it and should clearly know the background. So assume nothing, Right. When you and Tom decided to write a, a process panentheistic account of panpsychism uh, in a volume, and I'll link to it in the post for this, because you can also get the ebook for free, which is pretty cool, with pretty lots cool. of cool people on it. Um, uh, Go to Hard Broontrop is in it. Um, Philip Goff, both of them, of uh, Philip Clayton. Um, anyway, people have been on the podcast before. You should all go check it out. Uh, but uh, what do you think is what are the features or elements of a process panentheistic panpsychist vision that you thought, Tom, we got to make sure we emphasize these. Yeah. So I like to take it back to the basics. What, it, what constitutes reality, right? What, it, what is reality made up of, right? And if you change the narrative from it's, independent, enduring substances that sort of persist unchanged from moment to moment. Um, and that that's how we understand identity, you know, it's like, okay, well, there's a whole lot that can't be explained through that sort of substance-based ontology or explanation of the world. So process then, white through whitehead and says, well, it's actually not substance, but experience, right? It's, it's moments of experience. It's drops of experience. So Whitehead says that the final real things of which the world is made up are drops of experience. And those are complex and they're interdependent. And you think, okay, so what is reality made up of? It's these moments of experience. Well, is that unique just to humans? No, 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 no. Experience is fundamental to the core way that the reality is designed, right? The nature of reality itself. So Experience goes all the way down. Um, you extend experience beyond just uh, humanity to all living things. Um, so dolphins have experience. My dogs, Oliver and Winston, have experience. Um, sometimes they're positive. Sometimes they're negative, right? Because they're not just uh, sort of value-free experiences, but they were value-filled experiences. Um, and what we feel uh, are, are sort of also, this, this transmission of feelings and energy from moment to moment, um, right? So, again, the power of the past influences what's happening in the present. Do you so think I, that, I, uh, yeah, one ahead. quick question about that, that um, it, if, if all experiences don't have at least some, you know, proto-experiential part to it, right? Then you end up with some point uh, telling the story of our universe where it's like experientially vacuous and all of a sudden there is a immaculate conception in an event and all of a sudden this event was doing junk that the others weren't. And right. I think um, it, that was like subtle in what you're saying. I just think it's really important because 
if you're going to affirm the the validity, the valuation that's at the heart of any experience, including like the one that ethics kind of assumes on your neighbor and your enemy, then it either like popped out of nowhere, right? And then I think you literally have a metaphysical uh, hunt, kind of like how you explain the incarnation as divine invasion. You're like, well, you got Mary was a virgin, but also a sinless one. And like, and you start doing this. How do you explain this if it interrupts in the cosmic story? And the, 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 the thing that you were saying as if it was immediately obvious is no, we have to explain that we have experiences and they're valuative. And if there's no like magical moment, then it should always be there. And the complexity intensifies, but not the reality. So I like what John Cobb has been saying lately. It's like that modern worldview of substance ontologies, like just makes it seem like everybody's zombies. We're all zombies, right? Because we're just dead, dead matter floating around, sort of doing things. We don't have will. We don't have purpose. We don't have agency because all of those things require subjectivity that is true of living organisms that have experiences, which are value experiences. Preach. So you can't explain you know, so what, what do you want? Do you want a, a dead world without any hope, meaning, purpose, or value? Or do you want a living earth that is imbued with value in each moment of experience? Well, of course, we all want to think that life has some sort of meaning, that our actions, you know, have make a difference, that there's some teleology that's involved here. Process gives us that. Um, the only zombie that I'm aware of in Christianity is probably Jesus. Uh, he comes back from the dead and tells people to eat his flesh. I don't know. It's, but we don't have to get into that. So what happens if you extend? He told him to eat it before he died, Andrew. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, really? What? Wesley, Re- Wesley's going to be disappointed at this uh, Eucharistic trolling here. Um, <laughs> but sorry i derailed i don't affirm transubstantiation so we're good we're good or is everything transubstantiated me you know it's a hermeneutical (laughs) device the uh you know what's funny that's actually a fun thing if you uh, spend some time looking at process thinkers in different traditions because the process metaphysic enables you to to re-question things like someone could totally explain process by the process interpretation of every Protestant answer to the Eucharist and even the Catholic one. Cause there's a process version of them all where you're like, yeah, I obviously agree with our tradition and they're, and, uh, but on a whole, I think they're cooler than the ones that don't, but you, I interrupt. What, yeah, what does real presence mean in a temporal uh, worldview? Yeah. I don't know. That's a good question. Yeah. But, but back to, uh, yeah, turn it up to focus, 11. Right. So I think, one of the reasons why David Griffin, for example, talks about pan-experientialism as opposed to pan-psychism is this idea that experience is more basic and fundamental than consciousness. So there's something about psychism, about the psyche that implies sort of conscious awareness um, that he says is only actually relevant to uh, a certain select group of complex entities um, with you know, a central nervous system and things like that. Um, so we can explain sort of the emergence of consciousness uh, through smooth evolutionary theory, um, you know, emergence and those sorts of things um, where there's, okay, there's a point in time when which brains have evolved to the point where uh, conscious awareness is possible. But experience is something more fundamental, right? Um, you think it's funny when we talk about like medicine um, and, you know, you get friends and family who uh, get cancer, not fun. And then they go through treatment and be like, well, how is your, uh, how are your, your cancer cells responding to your chemotherapy? I mean, it's already built into our assumption that at the cellular level, there are responses. Responses require something to be alive. And in order for that to happen, there has to be some degree of experience, right? Um, now, of course, degrees of experience and degrees of complexity is all built into this, but that experience in some level, um, in, there's that some modicum of agency that goes all the way down. 
um, means that the world is full of um, a community of subjects, not a collection of objects, which I think is fundamental to the process worldview that also makes it an ecological worldview. Um, and so it's this, it's this sort of process pan-experiential of them says everything has experience, not just humans. Um, and God is wrapped up into that because uh, God and the world are intertwined and God experiences. Um, so it's actually not just that experience goes all the way down, but also all the way up. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, it's always good to know that when it comes to experience, process takes it up and down in every moment. Um, I'm passing on a couple jokes because I'm a, I'm a mature adult, but it's 11 o'clock for me and I'm drinking. So uh, the next question, I got two more. Are you okay with time? Yeah, we'll just, we can go quick. I, I can be, I can be more concise. Here we go. Well, I don't, you don't have to be concise. I'm not, I'm You're not like, going I'm anywhere. Tired. You're it's the 11. one that has to record. You're the one that I'm, I, I'm going to be up for a while. You have to record your world Christianity in the 19th century lecture. You yeah. know what I have to do? I'm going to grade papers and I'm going to be so happy when grading these papers because I got to hang out with you that people markings might go up, even though in the UK we double mark everything and pretend subjectivity is not involved in grading. But nonetheless, the next question is this one. I, I really like you does not have to be long, but it'd be really helpful because I've mentioned it on the podcast. It said trip. You randomly make a sides like, why head is more important now than he's ever been. Just think of the growth in all these other places. And um, now you're the, you're the director for the Center for Process Studies. From your perspective, when I make jokes about like the growth of process, part of it is that Whitehead as a philosopher has been a, a connection point for people globally in new ways. So outside of the, you know, North America and Western Europe, where I think people, it's really clear with some Googling, like what has been the partnerships have developed like in China and such to, to kind of explain the global network um, that you're helping to cultivate and facilitate? Yeah. So it's interesting. There's one center for process studies in the United States. There are other process groups, process organizations, but as far as like centers for process studies at universities, um, there's the, the one from Claremont now in Salem. In China, there are now 36 centers for process studies at universities around the continent. Um, it's like, it's crazy. So what are they doing, right? Because are they all process theology centers? No. In fact, most of them are interested in process uh, philosophy, uh, Whitehead's philosophy, apart from the, the, the theology and God talk. Uh, a lot of them are interested in process and ecology, uh, specifically through the lens of ecological civilization um, and the sort of uh, Whitehead's view of nature uh, and the concept of nature and its application for uh, understanding uh, humanity's place in the, the natural world and um, the sort of how we can uh, promote um, a sustainable and equitable society. And a lot of them are interested in process psychology um, so there's this, um, it, it tends more, I mean, right, so if experience and feeling um, and sort of aliveness and interconnection are all part of, uh, you know, that, that they're all part of uh, this basic worldview, um, then, then of course, within psychology, it lends itself more toward positive psych kind of uh, interpretations and things like that. Um, but one of the biggest areas actually is also education. Um, and philosophy of education. There's a number of universities in China that have process education programs and departments and, and centers. Um, Whitehead, you know, of course, we all read process and reality every night before we go to bed. Um, but, but Whitehead also has written on, on science, uh, right? You get science in the modern world, the concept of nature, um, religion in the making, uh, right? So also writing about religion. Um, and, and of course, then the aims of education, is one of Whitehead's uh, perhaps most famous books outside of theological circles. Uh, it has been Whitehead's views on education. So again, you think the world is alive. Uh, what does that mean for students? What does that mean for teachers? What does it mean for how we should relate and teach and go, right? So shifting from the thinking of uh, students as empty vessels that need to be sort of 
dumped knowledge into, right? I think he talks about it like a, a suitcase or something like that, um, right? Where students are alive, they're dynamic, they're growing, um, and there needs to be an adventure and a zestiness to uh, what we're learning and how we apply what we're learning. So it's not about the memorization of facts, but um, the understanding of core principles that can then allow us to apply what we're learning uh, to make a difference in the world. So it's, it's also the shift from value-free education for education's sake to uh, value-filled education for the common good, and the well-being of people on the planet. Um, so there's, there's lots of fun things like that happening. Um, Tim Eastman just came out with a great new book um, on, well, what is it? Untying the, on the Gordian Knot, I think is the name of it. Um, he's a, a, a process uh, physicist. Um, and it, it's, you know, a very impressive guy who's connecting Whitehead's uh, thought to uh, modern understandings in science. There's... Um, Oh, I don't know. I mean, does that, that's probably good, right? Yeah, there's, there's, those, those sorts of things are happening in the world outside of process Christology. Yeah. All right. Last question, Andrew. And this is an important one. All right. So if you, and Lucen Price wrote a book called Dialogues with Alfred North Whitehead. Um, I've, I've done that as my recommendation for not like people interested in process theology, but Whitehead to go like, you want a fun read? Like you can just pick this up. Like it's him telling stories basically about Whitehead and, and uh, <laughs> entertaining people. And you get his thoughts on all sorts of stuff. It's lots of fun, packed full of high quality quotes. Um, and I recommended it one of the homebrew members read it. And so this is like so much fun. I feel like I have an idea of his personality. And, uh, and so her question is, if you got to resurrect anyone for dinner party at the Whiteheads, you, it's you and three other people, Whitehead family, dinner who are you inviting and i i heard i have uh like multiple options this is this is why i find this to be simultaneously a short answer to give but also like what if you only get to do this once and i feel like and the more you know whitehead the more entertaining picking the right people is because of his personality, proclivities, Evelyn's big entertainer. They have like anyway. So, like the Whiteheads holler at you because you're the executive director of the Center for Process Studies, and they're like, Doctor Schwartz, we would like for you to bring three of your friends over to Boston for a dinner party. Then who are the three people? And they would say over to Boston because that's what people who were connected to Harvard do is like try to pretend like, oh yeah, we're, we're over in Cambridge. Uh, it's just yeah. some school over in Cambridge. Yeah. But you're in Los Angeles. So there, oh, well, I guess you're not in Los Angeles now, but you know, you're on the West coast. You may not know neighborhoods there. You know, it's yeah, like yeah, yeah, yeah. I would lived in Redondo, but if I was not talking to people say in LA, Los Angeles, right. I would say I'm in Los Angeles. And but if you're in LA, you're like, I'm in Redondo because they know that's next to the beach and they're jealous. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> I always told people in Claremont, you know, those days when it's 78 and you can wear jeans and a t shirt in Redondo, but then you get out in Claremont and it's 103. I'm like, whoa, I have jeans on because I live in Redondo. But anyway, so the Whiteheads, Andrew Schwartz, three people, uh, new extended edition of Dialogues with Whitehead coming out, What? who's in the chapter? And these are people that have passed, so I'm not picking other three of my living friends. You can pick anyone. But I mean, honestly, like if you're getting to bring dead people, like I'm going to pick dead people unless it's John Cobb. I That's feel what like- I was gonna say. That's exactly what I was thinking. He was the one. I'm, I'm, I'm part of the John Cobb fan club. Oh um, yeah, but uh, Catherine and I are battling for president. So 
you can be treasurer. I I accept that. All right. Um. So I think I would uh, I'd invite Plato. Oh, high quality call. Whitehead uh, believes that all of modern contemporary Western philosophy is a series of footnotes to Plato. Yet he has a lot to say that uh, sort of goes uh, against some of the the core Platonic and Neoplatonic views. So I I would want to see the two of them uh, in dialogue over schnitzel or something. Um, I don't know why schnitzel. Um, Maybe Whitehead would be vegetarian. Um, Another person I would invite would be uh, Einstein, um, Albert Einstein. Uh, because I'd want to hear them debate theories of relativity. Little known fact, fact, Whitehead developed his own theory of relativity as an alternative to Einstein's theory. Mm -hmm. I would love to see that debate take place. And he moderated the gathering of the Royal Society when Arthur Eddington presented the results confirming the theory of general relativity Hmm. how i asked wild right anyway i think maybe my last one would be um the buddha gautama buddha yeah right and here's why it might sound a little strange but whitehead says that he thinks that his philosophy his philosophy of organism process philosophy is more similar to eastern worldviews and philosophies than any of the sort of Western perspectives. And there's so much in Buddhist thought, right? The impermanence of everything, the doctrine of no self, the doctrines of emptiness that seem to overlap and integrate with the process perspective. I would love to hear Whitehead talk to the Buddha about um, anything that the Buddha wants to say, basically. Oh, that's, that's good. So, I think John Cobb once said something like, uh, not everything that is a uh, process is Buddhist, but all Buddhism is process. <laughs> I mean, d- don't, don't, don't quote me on that. Yeah. Don't attribute that quote to him. But I, I, I feel like that was something he said in passing once. Plato, Einstein, and the Buddha. Yeah. All right. That's a, they walk into a bar. Yeah. So that's the that, beginning of the joke. So, so, um, the, uh, I, I mean, I've been thinking about this question and I, I changed it a whole bunch, um, but I I thought Gregory of Nyssa hmm. because in his essay in it um, you know Adventures of Ideas he talks about how the <clears throat> Cappadocians develop right non competitive interpenetration of su- like intersubjectivity right and and he's like this is the third great idea of the West right so. Um, and then one of my answers was like to get Jesus and Buddha there at the same time so we could fix his kind of odd way of dealing with the East and the West and religion in the making to, so we don't get distracted by that. But then I was like, no, I want William James. Now I know that they were like around, it, but I, I personally just want to ask questions to watch William James and uh, Whitehead talk. So like, there's like that element, radical empiricism, pragmatism, all sorts of good stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I'm talking about. So I was like, no, nah, sorry, Buddha and Jesus, Nick say, uh, we're gonna keep this. Uh, go with William James. And then I said, I, 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 if I'm not allowed to have John Cobb come, if it can't be. It has to be someone dead. I, I would choose John Cobb to any dinner, no matter what, just because. Um, but he's 96 and going strong. So, yeah. 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 But no, but so William James, Gregory of Nyssa. And here's the thing that I always, I was struck by in the dialogues of Alfred North Whitehead, his love of music. And he regular, like his commentary on popular religion is hilarious. But he's, he's like, religion has a lot going for it because they always play music before anyone talks, so it might be true. It, he doesn't put it like that, but that sentiment's there, right? Like, that religion understands the aesthetics and all this kind of stuff. Um, so it recognizes art. And so I thought, what about Michelangelo? 
One is brilliant. And you, you said I hung out with Michelangelo, but. And he's good Michael, at nunchucks. Yeah. Not the turtle. <laughs> oh, <laughs> not the turtle. <laughs> not the turtle. But like Michelangelo it created this art. So the whole time he'd be discovering that everyone else there was like, oh, you're Michelangelo, right? And, <laughs> and so like he would get all this attention and they would be like all the, think of all the people that have wrestled with like, all oh, the fingers are about to touch on this, uh, you know, like the, the cathedral wall and all this kind of stuff. You, you want to know after Michelangelo has had a few, is he like, yeah, this was like, I think this is great. Or did he take it so seriously? It's like asking Bob Dylan about the lyrics of his songs where he gets offended that he needs to talk about it, you know, or, or, or is it like an invitation of this like long talk that then they all start going on? I feel like I wanted yeah. someone to like decenter it. I want to know like the William James Whitehead connection. Cause I can throw out questions to be like, y'all parse this junk. Right. The Nissa like, could, could William James and Whitehead be like, we love that inner subjectivity stuff. Let's expand it. But then Michelangelo, like basically everyone there is going to tell their friends in heaven about that time they had dinner with Whitehead and Michelangelo showed up. So, you know what I would want to see is that uh, a contrast between his pre Whitehead dinner where mm -hmm. he did the Sistine Chapel and his post Whitehead dinner where he did Concrescence Chapel and to see oh. if he would depict the God world relationship differently. Oh, there you go. There you go. And once he paints it, you'd be like, but could I put it on my book? Can yeah. I put it on my book cover? I don't, I don't, I don't want to, I was still all out. of our artist friends out there, please uh, do a great uh, mural of the God world relationship. There's, there's awesome. a multiplicity of fingers. They're going everywhere and overlapping. Just fingers. Lots yeah. of fingers. Yeah. Uh, they're just eternally generating fingers in every which way. Um, it is tough uh, when you have a, an event-based worldview to depict that in a static image. Uh, something feels short for that, right? Maybe it has to be a GIF. I don't know. Mm, there you go. Who knows? Who knows? But after we hang out with... Michelangelo after that it may happen, but thank you. A, so, king, a king meme maker these days, I think. Oh, or, or, or he like judges memes. You never know. He's like, oh, he That's mostly is making things so that other people, what that'd be the tricky thing. If you're an artist and you do stuff, you think memes are below you, but you do things that are easily memeable. Because then you're like, then all these people come up with crafty ways of proselytizing my art. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. But I've had a lot of fun. And uh, thank you for answering questions with me about process. It was great uh, talking with you. Anytime. The way I see it is that um, 30 minutes per question. It's all... Who knows? And you still haven't answered your favorite, like which Beatles album is the most processed. So next time you're on the podcast, uh, I'm going to try to remember first question. What is the most Beatles, like what most processed Beatles album? And um, I have thoughts, but I'm not going to give you any hints. Nope. No hints. I'll have, to, I'll have to, to reflect on that a little bit. Yeah. Or ask Janine. She might like have like a real clear answer that's like, clearly thought out because she created the 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 Beatles liturgy and um but I think if you know I think the, the the conclusion that I had after this conversation is that if you really love God and you want to make sense of the world and you care about the common good uh the well-being of people on the planet then you have to be a process theologian there's no other choice or you should at least be friends with some you know no you have to be a process theologian okay but that would sound coercive Andrew you, oh, say, well, no, like, no, no. I mean, I'm not saying you have to be. Okay. But if, if you want these things, then the there are really a short ace. It's more like you have to be. It's an it's a encouraging invitation. I challenge you to, I challenge someone out there to, to show me a better explanation of things than the process perspective. All right. But I don't know if you really want all those emails, but they can send them to you because I don't. 
they, they will get buried in my uh, quicksand email box. So. All right. All right. Well, I hope you have fun recording your lecture. Thanks.